in these lectures so far, we've been seeing how the capacity of narrative painting or um, pictorial storytelling uh, expanded dramatically during the Renaissance in Italy. We saw Antonio Polaiuolo paint a story from the legend of Hercules that had seldom been pictured before, and he gave the figures an amazing new mobility and personality. We tried to put ourselves in the heads of Polaiuolo's well-educated audience, uh, who knew that this picture tells only part of the story. We tried to fill in the rest, uh, what the hero was about to bring down on himself with that bow and arrow, and explore the consequences for the understanding of the painting. We saw Garof Garofalo, uh, two generations later, uh, paint the savage persecutor of the Christians just before he began his new career as a moral hero. Saul was traveling to Damascus to punish more Christians when Christ appeared and Saul fell down blind, helpless, no more knowing what's happening to him than, the, than his horse does. All this is set in a countryside that you could see not far from Ferrara where the picture was painted, as though it had happened there and then. And we've been looking at pictures not just for their beauties, but also for the work that they were originally meant to do. That is, put across incidents that had meaning for the audience. And we've been suggesting why these stories and these particular uh, images mattered to their audiences. Today we're looking at another Italian picture. This one painted towards the end of the 1500s, the late Renaissance by an artist whom I think only art historians have heard of, and maybe a few priests. Uh, Marco Pino, uh, painted around 1570 in Naples, and representing a subject that I think most people can probably identify. <coughs> but let's not read the label. <coughs> let's look at the picture first and just take a few minutes to do that. <coughs> Well, let's take, let's take note of what we see. <clears throat> there are a lot of people here, <clears throat> spread edge to edge, all of them wearing clothes, except one. The naked man is gesturing, looking towards the tallest person who's gesturing towards him. We see from his skin color and the white cloth uh, on the stone sarcophagus that this man uh, hasn't just been sick. It's worse than that. <laughs> and the man in red who supports him with one hand uses the other hand to hold a cloth to his face, not weeping, but holding his nose. The other man holding him cups his hand to his mouth and shouts. There are other conspicuous gestures. On the left side, uh, a young beardless man holds up a hand in surprise or rejoicing and then, kneeling in the corner, uh, two women express surprise, too. And there's a lineup of heads behind them. In the background, there are people who look on in various states of concern, sorrow, surprise, and some of them are straining to get a better look over the heads of others. And one of them looks right at us. At the right in the background uh, is a sort of overgrown natural arch, and at the left there's a view of a walled city with a pyramid. 
Now, of course, what we've been inspecting is a staging of Christ's best-known miracle, the resurrection of Lazarus. I want to read the one and only biblical account of the event in the Gospel of St. John the Evangelist, which I'll shorten a bit and paraphrase now and then. Now a certain man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village where Mary and her sister Martha lived. Now it was Mary who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and wiped his feet dry with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, look, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not lead to death, but to God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So Jesus waited for a couple of days and then told his disciples he was going to Bethany. They protested that he'd be in danger from the Jewish leaders, but Jesus persisted and he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. Then the disciples replied, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had been talking about his death, but they thought he'd been talking about real sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and I am glad for your sake that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let's go to him. So Thomas said to his fellow disciples, let us go too, so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days already. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, so many of the Jewish people of the region had come to Martha and Mary to console them over the loss of their brother. When Martha went to meet Jesus, she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will grant you. Jesus replied, your brother will come back to life again. Martha said, I know that he will come back to life again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of the life and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you, believe, do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who comes into the world. When Mary went to him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the, brother, and the people who had come with her weeping, he was intensely moved in spirit and greatly distressed. He asked, where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Thus the people who had come to mourn said, look how much he loved him. But some of them said, this is the man who caused the blind man to see. Couldn't he have done something to keep Lazarus from dying? The tomb was a cave and a stone was placed across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha replied, Lord, by this time the body will have a bad smell because it has been buried four days. In the King James Version, she says, but Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> Christ responded, didn't I tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus thanked the Father and shouted in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The one who had died came out, his feet and hands tied up with strips of cloth, and a cloth wrapped around his face. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. So some elements of the story that I want to stress are, first, Christ is performing not just for the benefit of Lazarus and his sisters, but also for the Jews who believed in the afterlife. He said. If you believe in me, you'll live forever. And he goes on to demonstrate. Second, his own disciples keep voicing their doubts to Christ. 
Is it safe for him to travel? If Lazarus is sleeping, that's fine, so wake him up. Why wake him up? And so on. And Christ, as a good teacher does, finds analogies to help them understand. And third is something we don't see in the picture. After Christ brings this dead man back to life, he himself is seized and killed, and afterward, he's brought back to life. So the scene is a foretaste of the central belief of Christianity, that to accept Christ is to become immortal. There will be a resurrection for everybody. And there isn't a more graphic advertisement for the need for faith and the reward of eternal life in all the scriptures than this particular story. It comes complete with demonstrations of disbelief. I mean, it's no wonder that the text is quoted everywhere around the world by preachers of sermons, by priests of conducting funerals, and no wonder that there are so many images of the scene of the raising of Lazarus. We'll come to some of those in a few minutes. But first I want to introduce the painter. Marco Pino was an artist somewhat like Garofalo, whom we met last week. A success in his time, prolific, almost entirely a painter of religious subjects, not a courageous inventor of new ideas, and nowadays considered to be a relatively minor figure. It's not easy to see most of his significant pictures, believe me, uh, which are in churches for which they were painted, uh, or to get images even to show you. But there are some very fine examples, uh, including a couple in this country, especially this one at Yale. Pino was born uh, around 1525 in Siena, not far from Florence, but a separate rival city-state with a less adventuresome culture, a city more like Ferrara, Garofalo's hometown. He was born a generation later than Garofalo, and his training was local, with the brilliant and eccentric Sienese painter Beccafumi, you see a picture on the right, the great altarpiece of St. Michael, uh, but not much of his brilliance seems to have stuck to Pino. Uh, the major event in Pino's artistic development was being sent to Rome at the age of 18, where he arrived in 1543, Raphael had been dead for two decades, and his pupils had been carrying on with major commissions for the Vatican. And there was a vast amount of contemporary painting for Pino to study. The huge frescoes, for example, of the Sala uh, di Constantino here, uh, painted by Giulio Romano and his team, probably from designs by Raphael, and many other big projects by the former Raphael assistants, for example, Perino del Vaga and Luca Penni, these were also there to learn from. Michelangelo was still very much alive and making himself felt by his last frescoes. The Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, uh, somewhat earlier, and the paintings in the Cappella Paulina, uh, on which the paint was uh, almost still wet. Michelangelo um, had more commissions than he could possibly handle personally, so he supplied drawings to the few artists that he trusted, such as Sebastiano del Piombo and Daniele da Volterra, who used them to paint works that were credited to those artists themselves. Um, Pino took part in some of these second-generation projects, but it's actually hard to see what he did. Uh, if you visit uh, San, uh, San Trinita dei Monti at the top of the Spanish Steps in Rome, and find uh, the chapel of uh, Lucrezia della Rovere by uh, this artist, Daniele de Volterra, you are not going to miss uh, the main attraction here, his uh, dazzling uh, frescoes uh, of the Assumption uh, of the Virgin with all those Michelangelo-like uh, disciples. But in search of Marco Pino, you have to look up to the vaulted ceiling to see the life of Virgin in pictures painted by uh, no fewer than six younger artists, including Pino. They're damaged, and who painted what up there has been proven very hard for specialists to figure out. But in any case, Pino and the others must have been supplied with drawings by Daniele de Volterra, possibly even big drawings, full-time size cartoons. So there wasn't a lot of room up there for individuality. 
The great compiler of artists' biographies, Giorgio Vasari, describes Marco Pino as working on a commission to decorate rooms in the Castel Sant'Angelo, once the tomb of Temp Emperor Hadrian, and then a papal fort. The Castel Sant'Angelo had recently been a kind of bunker or hideout for Pope Clement VII when Rome was invaded and sacked by mercenary soldiers hired by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Vasari wrote, uh, writes that, uh, and I quote him, the principal hall is very pleasing, being wrought in stucco and all filled with scenes from Roman history, for the most part executed by Perino's young men, that's Perino del Vaga, not a few from the hand of Marco da Siena, the disciple of Domenico Beccafumi. Well, this is the room he's describing, the Sala Paolina, built and painted for the immensely powerful Pope Paul III, Farnese. At the end, you can see a St. Michael uh, by Perino himself, uh, which we'll see again soon, and directly above it, you can see a scene, and that's right up here, you can see a scene by, designed by Perino and apparently painted by Marco Pino. It shows uh, a story from the history of the Jews by Flavius Josephus, when Alexander the Great, after his victory at Gaza, marches to Jerusalem, and instead of besieging the city, which was his M.O., kneels uh, before the high priest. Secular power yields to religious authority. No guest of the Pope would miss the lesson. Pino, if he's the one who painted it, did the work quite competently, entirely in the style of the artist in charge of the project, that is Perino del Vaga, and not without a trace, uh, without a single trace that I can make out of his own master, Beccafumi. The first real dated picture we have by Marco Pino gives a good idea of what he could do on his own. He painted this at the age of 20 or 21 for a church on the Vatican side of the Tiber. Uh, a lot of you now will recognize the subject um, here, uh, the conversion of Saul, which was conceived, you may remember, by some artists as a relatively private and kind of personal account, uh, encounter between Saul and Christ, or expanded uh, into a melee of panicked soldiers. Uh, Pino definitely goes for the melee, as you see, and fills the frame with running men and rearing horses in the spirit of the vast fresco of the battle by Giulio Romano that we just saw. Pino didn't need to study the horse uh, from a living animal. He could save himself the trouble uh, by getting hold of this woodcut by Hans Baldung Green, a woodcut you saw last week by Durer's pupil Hans Baldung Green, with its recumbent um, merry-go-round horse, and he could get help with the rest by shopping around among other artists' paintings. This reliance on other works of art rather than the study of live models is actually worth a short detour, which we will now take. <laughs> to understand Pino and his style of painting, I'm going to back away from him and say something more about how art in Rome had changed between Garofalo's time, when some of Raphael's frescoes were barely finished, and the time that Pino arrived 30 years later. For one thing, as you heard, the city had been plundered, invaded and plundered in 1527 uh, by the mercenaries under Charles V. Population had fallen by four-fifths, imagine, one-fifth of the population left. And many artists had left Rome, gone off to other cities where the economies were more stable and, plant, uh, and private uh, clients might be more numerous. The aesthetic ideals of the High Renaissance, as established by Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo, were, and I'm quoting Vasari's description of Leonardo, boldness of design, the subtlest imitation of all details of nature, good rule, better order, correct proportions, and divine grace, prolific and profound, endowing his figures with motion and breadth. You see that 
subtle imitation of nature and divine grace, motion and breath, and most obviously in the Madonna and Child with Saint Anne by Leonardo. In Raphael's fresco at the right of the ideal academy that he painted for the Vatican Stanze, there is the boldness, the rule, the order, the proportions that Vasari named, all in an idealized space as grand as the quality of thought that it honored and housed. The figures in both pictures have bodies that have been studied in drawings from the nude model, and they seem to have weight as well as energy. Each person is seized with thought, but for all their variety, there's a rational pattern. There's geometry and symmetry holding them in, and gravity holding them down. Within a few years, Raphael himself would start to destabilize this fictional world of rational forms and create what John Sherman called the new visual language, the first vocabulary of the Mannerist style, so-called, a new visual language. When Raphael, on the left, admired, had, had imagined um, the archangel Raph Michael uh, giving the coup de grace to Satan, uh, Michael arrives on tiptoe, like a dancer, weightless, rotating his body with a kind of easy grace. He doesn't need strength, he's got God. This is all sheerest artifice. And by the way, this uh, Saint Michael is an image that's uh, burned into the minds of a whole generation. Here's our man, Marco Pino, working in Naples 50 years later, painting the same subject and really just elaborating on Raphael. In his colossal statue of David, Michelangelo defined an ideal of dynamic stability, a perfectly proportioned man at rest with his weight unequally distributed on his feet, the classical so-called contrapposto. But in 10 years' time, the same artist gives another victorious man a completely different aspect. It's a much more complicated pose with shoulders sharply turned one way and the lower body the other, twisted into a kind of S shape, what was seen as snake-like and called a figura serpentinata. <coughs> Complex poses became the trademark of the style of the period. The writer Gian Paolo Lomazzo says something about Michelangelo that's particularly interesting for us. Michelangelo once gave this advice to his pupil, Marco da Siena, that's our, that's our guy, not a pupil of Michelangelo, but anyway, once gave this advice to Marco da Siena that one should always make a figure pyramidal, serpentine, and multiplied by one, two, or three. And in this precept, it seems to me, is contained the secret of painting, for a figure has its highest grace and eloquence when it is seen in movement, what the painters call furia della figura, and to represent it thus, there is no better form than that of a flame, because it is the most mobile of forms, and it is conical. If a figure has this form, it will be very beautiful. The painter should combine a pyramidal, fo pyramidal form with the serpentinata, like the twisting of a live snake in motion, which is also the, warm, the form of a waving flame. The figure should resemble the letter S, and this applies not only to the whole figure, but to also to its parts. In his large older piece of 1527, Parmagenino puts every figure into a kind of torqued posture of one kind or another, particularly the infant uh, Christ, who's kind of delicately uh, stepping away from his mother, the John the Baptist, uh, who's announcing him, serpentine, kneeling, full of this energetic zeal. Mannerist is a later term based on the Italian word maniera, which originally just meant style. But maniera soon came to mean a particular graceful way of posing figures. Raphael and Baldassare Castiglione wrote to the Pope in 1519 disparaging Gothic buildings, which for them were uncouth, the, the work of the descendants of Goths and Huns across the Alps. And they said they were lacking in grace without any style at all, senza maniera alcune. So maniera 
in that sense. The word maniera once also be referred to behavior. It meant what, knowing what to do in each occasion without effort. That was maniera. You had style. Castiglioni gave it another word, sprezzatura, a kind of easy grace. It's the savoir-faire that comes with birth and cultivation. But style, these people knew perfectly well, could become stylishness, something not so admirable, imitative, stereotyped, affected. Maniera could become mannered. So during the next century, it was seen that way. And in the 18th century, the term mannerism was invented as a label and a put-down for the art of the later Renaissance, including Marco Pino. Alongside the traits of the maniera I've mentioned, which were this exaggerated elegance and grace and anatomically unnatural proportions, came arbitrary picture space, not governed by strict rules of perspective, but flouting them. There were also exaggerated contrasts of scale. That's very striking on the right in the Holy Family by Parmigianino. With arbitrary space and scale often came a kind of crowding in of figures, as you see on the left, and Vasari's carrying of the cross, irrational but expressive and intensifying the action. These devices were the specialty of the contemporary artists that Pino studied, and we'll recognize all of them in his pictures. These traits got less pronounced in the second half of the century during Pino's career, particularly for the devotional rather than narrative commissions. Here's one last work uh, that Pino painted during his time in Rome on the left side uh, for the important church uh, next to the capital, um, Santa Maria in Araceli, which I show you with an older piece by his younger contemporary Federico Zuccaro, uh, both with slank, uh, somewhat boneless figures and straightforward symmetrical compositions. But in this conservative vein, Pino could paint very beautiful and feeling characters. Pino made his reputation in Rome uh, only part way, but uh, as a young man. But in Naples and Sicily, during the second half of his life, when the Yale picture was painted, uh, he really uh, became someone important. He might possibly have gone to Spain in the early 1550s. Some specialists have suggested this. But in any case, this was an era of itinerant artists who moved around Europe in search of patronage at the dozens of royal and imperial courts, where palaces and churches and private houses were being built and decorated all over the place. Italian uh, architects and painters and sculptors were particularly sought after, but the language of every traveling artist was international, the language of the maniera. The first picture that Pino did in Naples, the first dated one anyway, uh, this baptism of Christ shows both his strengths and his weaknesses pretty clearly. A tall, slender Christ uh, in a mildly serpentine pose, kneeling a bit strangely on the rocks, an even more emaciated uh, John the Baptist, and in the near foreground, uh, an allegorical figure of the River Jordan, a river god of the kind used in antique Roman sculpture to identify the locale, and by painters at this time, but usually in a much less showy and prominent way than this. <laughs> He's heroically uh, twisting, completely extraneous to the story, but upstaging the baptism. He seems mainly to be a demonstration of Pino's own virtuosity, both up-to-date and learned. I also think he might have been making a, a local illusion here. This is just my idea. <coughs> At least one river god was very well known to a Neapolitans. Just down the street from this church is this little square uh, that's been famous since Pino's own time, locally famous at least, um, for its Roman statue of a river god, uh, which traditionally uh, was called Il Nilo, the Nile, which gave its name uh, to this neighborhood. Uh, Pino's other works in Naples, <coughs> and later in Sicily, are mainly altarpieces of this kind, with subjects popular for churches and chapels, using a figure or two in athletic poses, and usually fairly routine in their stage business. 
There are a few exceptions, like Pino's take of the subject uh, of the beheading of John the Baptist. S Salome's lascivious dance before her stepfather Herod has done the trick. She's asked to have the head of the virtuous man who'd spurned her advances, and Herod has granted her wish. And the head of John the Baptist is about to be presented to her. The room is strangely vacant, except for a huge golden urn. The bars of the windows cast shadows into the room that plays off, play off against the lines of perspective. Spectators are looking in through the window. The leading actors are far downstage, where Salome waits with her platter for her prize, not in the room, but standing with her maid in some strange lowered place. She gives us a look of invitation to see what she's managed to accomplish. The executioner lum lunges forward, vigorously alive in contrast to the victim, who's just been butchered and is trussed up like a turkey at the market. Pino contrives all of the stage business only partly for the sage of stylishness, but I think to make us uneasy. This seems exactly the right way to feel about this scene and the whole bizarre and sordid story of the death of this prophet at the hands of corrupt rulers. Pino had patrons in various churches or religious orders who not only didn't pick his subject, uh, but instead had quite specific prescriptions for devotional subjects, which after all had hard work to do and messages to deliver. Um, here around 60, uh, 1560, Pino painted a conventional Christ in glory. Uh, here you can see with lots of angels all around, some of them pointing or looking down uh, at a scene below of Christ with his cross being crushed in a wine press and at the four corners of the pool into which Christ's blood pours, and there are four for church fathers shown collecting it. This is not new imagery. This appears in medieval manuscript illuminations and stained glass and so forth, but it is weird in a painting. Uh, the message that P Pino puts across in an old-fashioned, almost diagrammatic way is that the value of Christ's sacrifice and the importance of the sacrament that commemorates it, the Eucharist, the ritual of drinking the blood of Christ. This is a dogma that was being vigorously defended by the Catholic Church <coughs> at this point against the extreme Protestant claim <coughs> that the Eucharist was merely symbolic or possibly even superfluous in true Christian practice. <coughs> Just as interesting is this resurrection on the right, next to the St. Michael you saw earlier, next to its source by Raphael. Christ levitates above the tomb, while the soldiers react with a kind of ballet of flight and a whole repertory of more or less difficult poses. Can we say that all of this physical action is in support of the story, or is it just Poetry, is it just beautiful and admirable in itself? Are all of these actions, this sleeping and waking, announcing, running, are these all useful as narrative? Does the artist want to use the episode to tell us something about ourselves, about our lives and how we should behave? You may well doubt it. That's a question we can ask about the Yale painting too. Pino didn't just paint older pieces. There are some other pictures of a much smaller size that were evidently made for private clients, like a lot of Garofalo's works. From just the same period as the Yale Lazarus uh, comes this adoration of the Magi, where the worldly kings give tribute to a mere infant. It's a perfectly conventional composition with a few familiar things, especially the slender virgin and her graceful baby, who offers a foot with one foot and a blessing with one hand, and the customary figure uh, seen from the back, um, this young king swiveling around 
to get his golden urn from an attendant. The raising of Lazarus offers us, offered him more, the subject offered him more chance for action and variety, and Pino takes advantage of it. But some of the same devices are common to both of them. The landscape uh, setting is similar, the lineup of heads in the crowd in the background, the twisting man seen from the rear in both pictures, on one side here, the other side on the right. Pino's uh, standard of execution varied quite a lot in this later phase, and I think the Lazarus is one of the best. Having returned to the Yale painting, I want to leave it again for a short while. We'll come back, I promise, and look at it more closely. But since we're interested in how artists tell stories, I want to put this picture in the context of other works of the same subject, because Marco Pino inherited a long tradition of picturing Lazarus being raised from the dead. It was a hugely popular subject. It starts appearing a thousand years before Pino, in the early centuries of the church. In the upper left, you see a marble uh, coffin, a sarcophagus, made for a well-to-do Christian. These were ordered up all over the Roman Empire for obvious reasons, to reassure owners that while they lived, and other people after they died, that they too would rise again. For Lazarus to be recognized, he needed to be shown with a tomb, uh, which is what Roman sculptures usually put up in a corner. And sometimes his miraculous escape from death gets combined with other episodes, uh, like this one uh, here, the escape uh, of Daniel uh, from the lion's den, naked with, and without a scratch on him. Christ is often shown with a kind of magic wand, uh, as he has got here, and Lazarus is shown wound up in his burial sheet, standing up in his tomb uh, with steps and a little temple front. You can see cave temples with these fronts all over the Roman Empire today. This reflects the belief by Gentiles in later centuries that Jews buried their dead standing rather than lying down as the Romans did. You can see this formula applied uh, to an ivory plaque uh, from a book cover a little later in the lower left here with two more figures, one who seems to sort of swim in and reach for Christ's feet. That has to be Mary, Lazarus' sister, who, was once, who once anointed Christ's feet and dried them with her long hair. The other one wears a toga and is probably our friend John the Evangelist. There's a variant on this formula in the great mosaics of the life of Christ made in Ravenna uh, under Theodoric the Ostrogoth and very Roman in style. The right-hand image here shows Lazarus wrapped up like a mummy. His eyes are open, he bends forward, signaling that life has already returned to him. Christ uh, turns towards us as though he were preaching to us, which in a way he is. And the only witness is a young disciple who must again be John. There are no sisters, no crowd. The sky is gold. And there are only just a few shrubs to indicate the landscape. It's the essence of the miracle that gets presented in this form. Compressed and abstracted as a kind of straightforward belief in the simple truth that Christ is the way to eternal life. This kind of staging of the Byzantine period was the starting point 800 years later for Giotto in Florence and Duccio in Siena. Giotto's large frescoes in the chapel he painted for Enrico Scrovegni in Padua, the so-called Arena Chapel, tremendously expand the possibilities of picture language and visual storytelling. You see it here. Uh, Christ is commanding commanding that Lazarus be unwrapped. The sky is not symbolic gold of heaven anymore, uh, but the blue of the world we know. And there's a rocky landscape and a cave tomb with a heavy slab and a pair of laborers to move the slab. Everything exact and tangible. The disciples react with amazement and acceptance 
the sisters kneel in unison, and the Jews, who don't have halos uh, at all here, are clustered uh, together in the center. And one of them, the man in green, is the pivot. He puts one finger to his chin as a gesture uh, of puzzlement, and he extends his other arm in a reflexive gesture that links him to Christ, as though reaching for him and reaching for the truth of resurrection. It's amazing stagecraft. It turned the art of pictorial narrative into something much more cogent and subtle and appealing to the emotions. But Lazarus is still a mummy. His follower in Florence, Giovanni de Milano, or some educated person coaching him, saw that Lazarus didn't have to be shown standing or bound up with strips. Neither of these details was in the Gospel story. He imagines instead that Lazarus climbs up out of his sarcophagus, helped by John, who's seen from the back and who sneaks a hand up to his nose. Lazarus joins the company of the disciples by climbing out. This artist gives Mary and Martha ecstatic expressions, something new, and the Jews, who are framed by the Temple of Jerusalem, look to be of two minds about this miracle. Christ is back uh, in the picture, but on axis, central to the action. It's a picture full of fresh ideas and extremely uh, clear and graphic. I have to say the stand-up Lazarus didn't disappear. He returns in some works of the next century. Uh, when the sculptor Lorenzo Ghiberti was composing the reliefs for his first pair of bronze doors on the Florence Baptistry, and he had to get every episode into that tight uh, format of a Gothic trefoil, a quatrefoil, it was convenient for him to show Lazarus upright in the tight format here, upright with the other living people. Everybody who's essential to the story is there, Martha and Mary, uh, who who th throws herself um, and throw themselves at Christ's feet. Uh, Peter, who's now clearly distinguishable by his age and his beard next to the younger John, and a great <coughs> bonus figure at the left uh, who's just there to express wonderment. These reliefs by Ghiberti were re reference material for every Florentine painter, including Fra Angelico, uh, who borrowed figures from Ghiberti and also the setting from Giovanni di Milano, maybe a figure too. His mummy stands there, still wrapped up, but able nevertheless to make a gesture of prayer. And now, in this painting, an illusion of deep space, uh, buildings, clear air, and bright light. In the same period, Northerners painted the raising of Lazarus, as you would imagine, uh, as an even more realistic and particular vision. Uh, here on the left, the artist puts the tomb of Lazarus where it might well have been if Lazarus had been Dutch, uh, <laughs> in a church, under one of the floor slabs. Martha and Mary are there with a few disciples. Uh, on the right hand of Christ, which is the place of honor, and the Jews are on the left side, wearing all kinds of outlandish costumes. In the center, quite unusual in its prominence, is the figure of Peter, the first head of the church, who's urging the Jews to see the proof of Christ's divine powers. Well, the composition is designed, in other words, not just to show the miracle, but to emphasize the role of the church in helping the faithful gain eternal life. This artist uh, is the first great painter of the Northern Netherlands. This is Albert von Oudewater, and this is his only secure work. The painter of the other picture is much more prolific. His, this was Albert's pupil in Harlem. He's called Kirchen tot Sint Jans. He puts the scene, also puts the scene in a contemporary setting, as though it were happening right here in the present, or then in the present, with the donors uh, of the painting included, up front, praying for their own resurrection. Here's the husband and the wife, um, and 
the um, daughter, who's a nun, and the figure of the younger daughter, who is much younger. <laughs> And a dog, <laughs> faithfully present, will come back to him. Lazarus looks dazed, and Peter is incredulous as he leans in close to inspect. In the center is Mary Magdalene, gorgeously dressed, costume is a Burgundian noblewoman, and John is there too, and the skeptical Jews in exotic outfits. So this is, the, this is the cast that we're used to, but treated a lot more individually. The background that we see from a higher vantage point than normal is deep and limpid, with Jerusalem actually seen in the far left. Part way back in the distance is an earlier episode in the story in which the sisters ask Christ to come and heal their sick brother. So we have a kind of conflation of time and ep episode into a single image. And one last northern example is this astonishing panel uh, in the great altarpiece uh, in uh, St. Wolfgang uh, in, in the Tyrol by the great Tyrolean painter Michael Pacher. He puts the scene um, not in a church but in a kind of pavilion outside a huge Italian looking palazzo or possibly monastery and he turned the viewer's position, our position, around 180 degrees so that we see the disciples, we see the doubting Jews, but down low. We see them from a low angle as a kind of Lazarus eye viewpoint, maybe to help imagine ourselves as Lazarus, as candidates for resurrection ourselves one day. In Rome, uh, neither Raphael nor Michelangelo painted this subject. But we've got a picture that had a kind, it has a kind of grand synthesis by an artist who was in the thick of papal commissions. That was the Venetian painter Sebastiano del Piombo, uh, here on the right. Uh, Sebastiano was a kind of facilitator for Michelangelo, who knew both artists well, Michelangelo and Raphael, and who came up against Raphael in a competition staged by the Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who ordered two large altar pieces. Uh, Raphael was supposed to paint the Transfiguration and Sebastiano the raising of Lazarus. And when they were finished, Vasari says that they were equally admired. In the raising of Lazarus, uh, Sebastiano had to compose a subject that had always been horizontal or square and turn it into a vertical picture, which he did by enlarging the figures, by filling the upper part with a bigger cast of extras, by placing them on rising ground uh, leading up uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, and in the picture, a sort of zigzag play of arms, legs, forms all the way up that lends a kind of excitement to the picture. And of course, he adds these bright, sharp colors. The new thing here, though, is the Lazarus, uh, who has the tremendous physique of a Michelangelo nude. Christ commands that he be unwrapped using a pointing gesture that recalls God the Father's giving life to Adam by Michelangelo. And Lazarus himself, himself uh, is so alive now that he helps out by pulling off his own wrapping and stepping clear of his winding sheet. Pino certainly saw Raphael's transfiguration, but probably not the Lazarus by Sebastiano, which the Pope had already sent to France and installed in the Cathedral of Narbonne. One Lazarus he must have seen was this enormous picture, 15 feet wide, by Girolamo Muziano, uh, painted in 1555, which is immediately famous, now almost forgotten. It's in the Vatican where you can see it. Famous for a good reason. It's grand in scale, it's clearly and beautifully organized, it's a return to clarity and away from the eccentricities of the maniera that we have been looking at. The painting by Pino came 15 years later, and it has some similarities to Muziano's composition. 
but it hasn't let go of the complexities of poses that were still in fashion. Pinot never gets quite as virtuosic or refined as his older contemporary uh, Francesco Salviati here on the right, or as interested in dramatic effects of, of light. But you can see in the twisting figure um, at the left, for example, and other places, poses that Pino echoes uh, in his own figures at the edges of the right, at the edges of right and left. The most original interpretation of the subject is certainly the one Caravaggio painted in Sicily while he was a fugitive from the law and not for the first time. The upright altarpiece format gives him another chance to create one of his vast, somber, empty spaces above the actors that makes the action so much more solemn. Lazarus is truly a corpse with the stiffness of rigor mortis, but he shows life by flinging his arms wide in a gesture of kind of helpless acceptance. It also, not accidentally, prefigures Christ's posture on the cross. And since he's being carried, it echoes images of the entombment of Christ, too. Lazarus is, recommend, is resurrected by the command of Christ, who, however, is over here in the shade, whose pointing gesture, like Sebastiano's Christ, recalls God the Father on the Sistine ceiling, bestowing life on Adam. Again, no accident. The Bolognese painter Guercino uses Caravaggio's raking light, but he pushes the action much closer to us, eliminates all but a few of the disciples and the sisters. <coughs> Lazarus is not being unwrapped, but instead his hands are being untied. The drama is enacted by those eloquent hands clustered in the center, commanding, loosening, grasping, showing. I'll end this survey with another highly theatrical reenactment, this one by Rembrandt. Painted when he was 25 or 26 years old. Set, set inside a large cave, hung with, presumably, Lazarus's clothes and armor. The cast of characters is small, and everybody contributes a vigorous expression or a gesture to the amazement of the event as the corpse um, in his burial sheet sits up with his eyes rolling and cheeks collapsed. And Christ stands on the lid of the tomb with his arm raised up like a puppeteer or, or, a, or a magician. Rembrandt did the composition over a second time in a large etching, switching his vantage point to the back of the cave adding a few more exclamatory figures. And these have an individuality and a genuine feeling of personal distress that adds something quite fresh to the long tradition of Lazarus scenes. One artist who studied this print on the left very carefully, uh, left and right, very carefully, was Vincent van Gogh, two centuries later, while he was being kept in the asylum of Saint-Rémy. This was a man who thought deeply about death and salvation. And he made a painting out of this detail, editing out most of the figures, including Christ, and making Lazarus look quite a lot like Vincent himself. <laughs> this, the new presence in the scene here is this enormous sun, it's a life-giving force, this is an artist who made other pictures at the same time that have rebirth and renewal in nature as a theme. It's, it's very hard not to read this picture as the artist's dream of some miracle that would liberate him from his own devils and his own afflictions. We've looked at Pino's painting of the late raising of Lazarus as a good example of late mannerist style in Italy, 
with all of its gracefulness and its exaggerated artifice, you might well ask, is this just style for its own sake or does it actually support the telling of the story? Does the style suggest particular ways of understanding the account in John's Gospel? Now let's look again to finish and start at the center. Christ has commanded that the stone be removed, that Lazarus come out, that he be unwrapped, and that's just happened. As Lazarus returns to life, he spreads his arm and arms and reaches out, seemingly imploring, accepting, and Christ reaches towards him. Behind him, there's an old man with a walking stick, who can only be St. Peter, holding up a hand in some combination of amazement, um, seeming comprehension, but with a gesture that seems to also invite explanation. This is Peter, not quite getting it, uh, but working at it. And the whole story is there in those hands, acted out by hands. Here, Christ's summoning him to life, Lazarus reaching out to accept, Peter puzzling it out, trying to understand the truth. At the left, um, in virtuous blue, with her hair uh, under a cap, is the stay-at-home sister, Martha. Nearer to us is her sister, Mary, the outgoing one, the one who John makes a point of saying had anointed Christ's feet and cleaned them with her hair. In Pino's time, that Mary was often taken to be Mary the sinner, Mary Magdalene, the reformed prostitute. In any case, this Mary refused to believe that her brother could live again. She, she says, he's been there for four days, he smells bad. It's these two women who had their faith tested. Mary's uh, see-through blouse and loose hair give the picture a little jolt of sexual electricity on top of all this. And Pino gave them large hands and very long fingers, the better to express their wonderment with. Behind them uh, is the tall young man with his sensuous belly button, a favorite anatomical detail of painters of this period. You can see a lot of them upstairs in the galleries adjoining the picture by Pino. He flings one hand up, one arm up, as if to say, behold. With the other arm, he holds a book, and on the cover of the book is an eagle. That's his attribute. Both of them identify him as John the Evangelist, who wrote the only account of the miracle, who was evidently an eyewitness, which he's shown as here. Pino has him tote that book along like a diary, a kind of reminder to the viewer that we can trust the story that John told. Then that lineup of heads behind, most of them Jews, who, as John says, came out from Jerusalem to console the sisters, but a few of them are treated quite differently. At the far left here, an older man with a strange cap scowls. Next to him, a man in a red hat and pale, uh, pallid complexion looks on unmoved. I think these are intended as the Jews who are described in the next chapter of John's narrative as returning after this event, returning to Jerusalem, having seen Christ revive Lazarus, who report the event to the high priest and setting in motion the next events. The surveillance of Christ's activities, his capture, his torture, and his execution. Between Peter and Christ, uh, you will have noticed uh, another head um, who looks strangely contemporary. Um, he's watching Christ, but he's almost looking at us. And we have no idea what Pino himself looked like, so we can't know if this is the artist himself portraying himself in the picture. Sometimes we see this at this period, or possibly a man who commissioned the painting, which we also see. In any case, this presence of this figure looking out at us is a statement of witness and belief and an invitation for us. Lazarus is slender 
and has a pay, a gray uh, pallor. His face is bony and it expresses not dazed awakening, but what I think is meant as a kind of rapt and anguished need. His pose is something new for a Lazarus. He's stepping or sliding forward with one leg while his other leg is tucked under him in a way that would be very uncomfortable for me, for example. <laughs> I, I only know one other figure in art who does this with his lower body. You've actually seen it before. It's the rare and famous pose of Michelangelo's figure of victory whose knee holds down the vanquished man. I'm not going to push the resemblance since most other things are different here, but that visual quote would make sense for the figure of Lazarus here, whose victory over death is the focus of the painting. Yes, I did skip the dog <laughs> down there in the corner. He's next to Lazarus um, looking alertly out. He's an old conventional sim symbol of faithfulness. Think Fido. In, in Latin that would be Fido. Faith. That's what the picture's about. We see him often enough in Flemish and Dutch paintings of this period and earlier. And in fact, you saw one earlier in the painting of Lazarus' resurrection by Geert van Tolti-Sintians, but I don't know any in Italian ones. In any case, Pino's performance is, in one sense, art about art. That's part of his virtuosity, to be an appropriator of famous poses, to allude to well-known works of art, to build them in for the benefit of connoisseurs who will spot them. Mary on the ground um, at the left, um, with her arm extended, might well recall the saint sitting at the left in Raphael's transfiguration. Both were witnessing a miracle of Christ and expressing their wonderment. So even as he creates an expressive figure, Marco Pino of Siena is reminding his audience of his own artistic lineage through the great line of painters descending from Florence to Rome to him. So far, I haven't said enough about what's so striking about this collection of actors and their poses, um, and that is their extreme artificiality, the exaggerated refinement, the collapsed space, the kind of attenuated physiques, larger-than-life gestures, the hyper-bright colors. A lot of us were brought up to suspect any kind of artificiality as sincere as insincere or, or actually dislike it as false, the way we did with you know, florid uh, Baroque uh, singing and uh, sort of silly conventions of body acting in ballet. Mm -hmm. But at this period, all over Europe, where art and poetry and music were concerned, the, world, the word artificial actually had positive meanings. Something artificioso was artfully made. It was a term of praise. In 1548, Benedetto Varchi defined a, the intention of art as to create what he called an artificial imitation of nature. Artificial, meaning not literal, but ingenious. Not easy to do, but hard to do. Requiring that the artist have the quality of what they call facility. Artificiality, facility were brother and sister. Another contemporary writer, uh, Lodovico Dolci, wrote that the that facility is the basis of any art. You used facility to overcome difficult tasks, such as inventing a pose and getting it right, or arranging a group of figures so that it's pleasing and it expresses the actions and the emotions of the figures effectively. Facility was related to virtu, a word that's hard to translate, but the root of our word Virtuosity, virtu, the ability to solve hard problems, to master complexity. The other Renaissance term that's related to this is difficulta, which is not difficulty, but having overcome difficulty with your virtu. So one part of Pino's virtuosity was to impose a visual order on this big gesturing crowd. He does it by creating a kind of wave that runs through the picture midway. 
from edge to edge, left to right, undulating, you can see it through the arms and drapery of many of the figures which seem to connect in line. And there's another pattern that stabilizes everything, a big a triangle here with a broad base that comes to a top here and comes down is carried out uh, by uh, the arm um, through John's arm and comes down through the arm of the shouting man. And the apex of that triangle is right on the center line, that key place where the hands come together, that cluster of hands that tell the tale of Christ's mastery, Lazarus's dependence, Peter's comprehension. So Pino creates complexity, he masters it, and he helps the viewer through it. It's also a painting that represents, of course, the story, a story that, uh, about the necessity of faith. It's a painting, too, about the artist's facility, about the overcoming of difficulty that is the basis of any art. The next lecture um, in this series is about an extraordinary uh, picture by Rubens, an artist for whom nothing ever really looks difficult, uh, and a famous myth in which a pair of lovers ask for trouble and get it. So please try to come. Thank you.